the Dragon is um, another Stanford uh, University model. It's converted to PFT volume, uh, but in this case, I won't really render it at very high resolution. I'll actually reduce the number of subdivisions to one. <coughs> and um, right now, I'm rendering without uh, depth of field. So I'm uh, creating this uh, cloud of very visible particles. I wanted you to actually see the jittering of the particles and the gaps between them. I'll explain in a second why. So if I disable the jittering and render the whole thing once again, uh, you'll notice that the particles are distributed in a grid, as you would expect. And it's a very visible grid, and that was my goal in this case, to show you how they are placed here. And in fact, I can uh, go even further and switch this one to nearest, and this will create even uh, more obvious grid. Each particle will just draw into a single pixel. This is a particle, this is a particle, each one is a particle. So, let's switch back to bilinear and enable the depth of field. So here is the depth of field, it's currently disabled, and the sample rate, which is one of the important uh, parameters which define how uh, high the quality will be and how slow it will be to calculate, is set to 0 0.1. Whenever a particle has to be uh, drawn uh, in a defocused area, it will be drawn multiple times as multiple samples, and this controls how many of those samples will be created. I'll shift this slider down to 0 0.01, and now the sample rate is the lowest possible. I'll enable the depth of field, and remember we are rendering a grid here, uh, but I'm rendering with relatively extreme depth of field settings because this is a very small object, and I'm doing like macro photography and getting it to look very small, and what you see is suddenly all the particles are actually jittered, especially in the back where it's very defocused, and where it's in focus around the ear here, it's, you still see the grid approximately. This is how it was. This is with very low quality depth of field. So the depth of field, in fact, is actually using, when I go here and right click on the spinner, it will go back to 0 0.1 default value and I render once again. And this time, the quality will be slightly higher than previously. Here it is uh, with the lowest quality and this is with a little bit more quality and the grid there is still in focus. Of course, if I render the whole thing as jittered particles, this will be also jittered, and this will be more jittered, and it will be blurry and blurry. So, uh, my suggestion is, since using relatively high values for uh, the sample rate can take relatively long time to render, compared to the second or two that it takes to render, this takes four seconds with this depth of field. If I increase this a lot, or especially if I bring it up to one, the quality will be awesome, but the time will be really slow. So I generally uh, suggest that you go with the lowest sample rate, jitter the particles around without actually multiplying them a lot, in order to figure out what uh, the uh, good settings are for your f-stop and focal length and focal distance and so on. And once you're happy with the general look, then you start increasing this, go into the default settings, and if it's still too noisy, you go a little bit higher and so on, but never go to very high values because that might waste time. The other thing that we have to discuss are those controls here, the f-stop, the uh, focal length, and the focal distance. They are currently taken from the renderer because I haven't told the camera to be used. In order to tell the depth of field to actually use the camera settings, all I have to do is select the camera and add the Krikatoa camera tag. When I do this, if I don't check any of the options to overwrite any settings, the renderer will look and say, hey, this camera has a Krikatoa tag, so I'm going to get from the physical camera settings of the, the Cinema 4D camera, the f-stop and I'll take the focal distance and all the data will be coming from there. So right now if I render, the actual focal distance of 2,000 centimeters would be used instead of the only 40 centimeters that I need for this small object. That would be a very bad idea, it would be very defocused. If I want to uh, override some of those settings, I can do that. So I can go and say, no, the focal distance will actually be, I don't know, 100 centimeter. If I do this, still these settings here will be ignored and the camera settings will be used except for the settings that are already overwritten, then these settings will be used. So I have three levels of control, global render controls for the depth of field, camera controls when a camera tag is added, and camera overwrites when you want your camera to render differently in Krukatoa and in the physical renderer or the standard renderer of Cinema 4D. You want your focal distance to be different at Krukatoa time, but when you render the same camera in your standard renderer, it should use a different focal distance. You can do that. 
So that was about the depth of field. Uh, math objects, I haven't demoed any math objects today, but I had them in the NAB demo, so go and watch the videos about how to cast shadows and how to occlude particles and how to composite occluded particles and for, uh, foreground particles in your uh, final rendering. Uh, the only thing that I mentioned here is that we have an enable, global enable checkbox, which if it's disabled, no math objects will be calculated. So if you have hundreds of meshes, and you basically just add, I can probably do that, I can add uh, quickly some geometry that's a huge sphere, because our scene is so small, about a 10 centimeter sphere, and move it somewhere in front. Uh, and uh, in order to make this a math object, all I have to do is go to the Krikatoa uh, uh, tags and add a Krikatoa mesh. Now I have the checkboxes visible to camera, visible to lights. So rendering now with enabled math objects would actually map out the particles that are behind the sphere. Uh, and my, I hope my depth field wasn't enabled because that's taken a while. I'll stop it and check what settings I have. Uh, depth of field, yeah, I had it on. I'll turn it off for now. OK, now you see that the particles that are actually behind the sphere are not visible. And if I go here and enable occluded particles and render once again, the particles that are behind the sphere will be sent to a different layer. So looking at my uh, layers, I have now here the occluded pass. These are particles behind, and these are the particles in front. Uh, and that means that if you take these particles, then you render the sphere in the scan line, I mean, in the standard renderer or in whatever renderer you want, and then take this one and you layer them in After Effects or in uh, New Confusion or whatever, uh, and the sphere is semi transparent and has an alpha channel, it will actually reveal this pass here. Uh, and to reveal the particles behind it, and then the other particles will be in front of it, and the whole thing will still function. And if there is anti-aliasing on the sphere, it will correctly occlude particles which are behind and reveal particles that are in front. So if you want to disable this kind of uh, uh, rendering, all you have to do is disable globally the map objects, and then this won't run. Otherwise, you have to go to each one of the tags and disable visible to camera, visible to light. That's a little bit too much. And uh, the, the controls underneath you won't use ever. Most probably they are for integration with uh, PRMAN by Pixar. You need a Vitex library and you can pick uh, depth uh, holdout, which is saved as a Vitex file. I've never used that in production, but we have it in the standalone renderer, so it's exposed in the UI. You can also limit the number of threads that are rendering. This is a, a quick warning. You have to uh, remember that if you're rendering on 32 threads or uh, like huge number of cores, the way particles are rendered in multi-threading is that we split by distance to the camera and render the particles in slices and then combine them into the final image. That means if you have 16 or 32 threads, that's the number of image buffers that will be allocated internally in memory in order to render in multi-threading. And that is first memory overhead and second, lots of memory used. If you're rendering an 8K image with 32 threads, you might actually run out of memory. If you have on the 64 gigs of RAM, you might run out of them just allocating image buffers. That's why if you have a super system with many, many cores, like a quad uh, Xeon with hyper threading on and stuff like that, 16 or 32 threads, it's a good idea to limit it to 8 or 16. Or if you start seeing that too much memory is being used and uh, you're rendering huge resolutions, 4K, 8K, and above, uh, then it's a good idea to actually reduce the number of threads. It won't get that much slower rendering. I mean, additional threads add speed, but not linearly. So it might get two times slower, but it will use 10 times less memory. So it's a good idea to play with this if you have a super system. My computer has only four cores with hyper-threading eight threads. Typically, I keep it like that, and it works well. And I have only 12 gigs of RAM on this system. For about uh, half a billion particles, it works pretty well. 